like we're in front of like a big crowd. So you won't really be able to um, chat with the presenters and your cameras are off, but you can um, chat by texting through the chat box. And also you can ask direct questions about the content in the Q&A box. Um, so those are at the bottom of your screen. And um, we do have a great lineup of speakers today. And I'll start by introducing myself. Um, my name is Amy Dabbs. I'm the Clemson Extension School and Community Gardening Coordinator. And I'm a horticulture agent. And I have been for um, over 10 years now. Um, before that, I worked at the South Carolina Botanical Garden um, as a youth educator and horticultural therapist. And um, also with us today is Megan Shearer, the School and Community Gardening Program Assistant. And she's the one who's been communicating with you throughout the, um, throughout the process of getting into the webinar. She, she, she sent you a um, communication this morning. If you signed up before 9 a.m., you would have gotten a MailChimp newsletter from us that has all the uh, links and handouts for, from today's speakers so that you don't have to write a ton of notes down um, as we move through all these resources. If you missed it, we will follow up afterwards and we'll kind of catch up with anybody that you know, may have registered late or is just joining us now. So no worries if you missed that, we will do a follow up round. So, um, and Megan is going to uh, be in charge of giving out door prizes later this afternoon. And um, we really appreciate all that she does to keep us uh, moving forward. Um, also with us today uh, is Ben Cease, the Farm to School Program Coordinator at the South Carolina Department of Education. And um, we'll hear from Ben in just a minute about um, his program and some wonderful grant opportunities that are available across the state. Also with us today is our friend from the South Carolina Farm Bureau Ag in the Classroom, the Director Tracy Miss Kelly. Carolyn Lindstrom um, from the NUSC Boeing Children's Wellness Center was unable to join us in person today, but I have a recorded um, program from her um, at the end of my presentation. You're gonna wanna stick around if you're in her program areas. Um, they have a lot of amazing resources. And then the, the dynamic duo of Amanda Edwards and Ada Gordon, um, they are with us from, they're the managers from the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control's Office, Office of Solid Waste Reduction and Recycling. And they are going to show us um, how they're using their love of food and their um, 20 years of experience to head up the Don't Waste Food SC campaign. Um, this uh, campaign focuses on bringing together every individual and organization in South Carolina to prevent, donate, or compost extra food rather than wasting it. And you guys are in for a real treat. They have put together an amazing presentation that is interactive, fun, and I even learned things when we did the practice this week. So I'm really excited for everyone to join us for this um, this morning. So this is sort of a rough breakdown of how the morning is gonna go, um, how our day's gonna go. Um, we usually, if you've been with us before, this some of this may be um, a repeated message, but you know, we think it's important to share it with those who have not been with us. Um, you, this would have also come out through the MailChimp newsletter this morning. And I have to remind everyone before um, we move forward that if you are a um, South Carolina licensed educator and you need a renewal hour certificate, those are available at the end of the program. And then also we have an evaluation that we would love for you to fill out so that we can figure out how to do a better job in the future. So I am going to take a moment and just tell you a little bit about our School Gardening for South Carolina Educators program. Um, I know people, you know, everyone is having just kind of a tough time figuring out how we're going to get back into schools, but when and if you do, um, I want you to know that we're here for you. We have a lot of good resources for outdoor learning, and we hope that these will be useful to um, everyone as we move forward in the school year. But real quickly, I just want to just point out some of the ways that the Clemson Cooperative Extension Service um, provides research-based education to citizens of the state. And we have a lot of outlets, including the Home and Garden Information Center. Um, we have the Making It Grow um, television show on SCETV. We have the 4-H program, which we have some awesome 4-H agents joining us today. And you can see them over in the chat. And hopefully, they can uh, raise their hand and, and tell you what county they're in over in the chat box. Um, I know a lot of them are here from, particularly from the Low Country. 
Um, these are great resources and also the Master Gardener program. So these are just some of the great ways that Clemson Extension reaches out to sort of fulfill our mission across the state. So school gardening is near and dear to my heart. It's something that I've been involved in with for, with for over 20 years. And I've been a little troubled by some of the re or some of the um, news stories that have been coming out lately that say that the average American can only name about 10 plants. Yet these are the, the, the very um, organisms, organisms that we rely on to breed. So it's really important to me and to everyone at Clemson Extension that students get an opportunity to learn about where their food comes from and how to garden and um, to take advantage of all the lessons that come about. And fortunately, um, there are a lot of research studies that have been carried about, out about the benefits of school gardening. So if you need, if you'd like more information about this, you can reach out to me. I have scads of, of research studies that, you know, I'm happy to share with you. Um, but some of the things that have come up over the last few years um, is that school gardens help broaden children's experience of ecosystem complexity. It teaches students about food systems ecology, especially when they're involved in vegetable gardens. School gardens can help shape students' environmental values, and they can actually help improve students' test score and scores and school behaviors. So we are really um, emboldened by this and excited about this. And so we tried to figure out a way to create a training program that would help educators who really want to bring school gardening to their students um, in a way that's replicable, in a way that is, um, you know, kind of to the point and doesn't take a lot of busy educators time. So we came up with an online training, um, School Gardening for South Carolina Educators. This is a five week online training that we offer several times throughout the school year. It is asynchronous, so you don't have to show up at a certain time like this webinar. This is actually something you can kind of do on your own time. We typically would have a hands-on workshop, although for this coming school year, we'll have to figure out, um, uh, you know, in the world of COVID, we'll have to come up with an alternative uh, for the hands-on workshop. But this course is pre-approved by the South Carolina Department of Education for 20 renewal credits. Um, it's reasonably priced, and the reason that we give a discount for a team of three is because we really want to build in that sustainability. Um, we know that educators do tend to move around um, in the district or out of the district, and we want to make sure that if you start a school garden, that there's someone there who can sort of pick it up and keep moving with it, even in the absence of a key um, person. We have a lot of fun at our hands-on workshops, and I hope that one day we'll be able to resume those because we do miss seeing everybody in person. Um, our program includes a K through eight um, STEM curriculum. This is a, a line, I'm sorry for the picture with the salad on top, but that's what we do. We eat and, and learn at the same time. Um, but this is a K through eight STEM based curriculum that is um, South Carolina standards aligned. And we love this curriculum because it ties in really well with, um, with the school garden program. And then we also have a technical guide that is a seasonal planting guide and calendar for school gardens. And we, we have an upstate and a low country version of this book that we um, include with the registration. So if you were to go out and purchase these two books right now, they would be um, over $100 combined so you get them with the class fee for $75 or 175 for um, a set of three books so you really are getting a big value with the course this um, when we were trying to figure out how to really support educators in their goal to create school gardens technical support was right at the top of the list so these ladies are some amazing low country track county master gardeners who um, signed up to help us deliver transplants so we do have turnkey garden kits, and one of the things that we offer in that is transplant delivery. We could not do this alone though. We started out with a pilot program with initial funding from the College of Charleston in Boeing, South Carolina, and we expanded the program statewide. And we could not do it without South Carolina Farm to School and with the Boeing Center for Children's Wellness. Um, this slide is already out of date because just this summer we've, um, through these workshops, we've trained more educators in general, but um, we have a, we, through the online course, we've trained about 1,300 educators. We have 200 plus school gardens and we're expanding to each of the counties in the state. So we're really excited and um, thankful for the support that we've gotten um, in this program. 
So I mentioned our turnkey garden kits, and here's just a few examples of students um, and their giant squash plant, and they all have squash, <laughs> most of them have squash. Um, we tried to also think about how we could alleviate the burden on educators. Um, you know, maybe you've gotten a grant or your PTA says, hey, you know, we'd like to sponsor this, but finding and sourcing materials while you're also teaching and, um, you know, meeting and doing all the things you have to do in your day is something that we could take on. So we looked at a way to create a turnkey garden kit using supplies that were easy and um, can be delivered to the school that are um, food safe and um, really things that we would use if we were going to garden. So I'll just let you know that I have one of these, um, the bottom bed on my back deck, so do my parents. So when I say it's something we would use, we are using them. Um, we work with Lowe's and some other vendors to get things delivered right to the school because we want um, the energy, the synergy, the excitement of um, of starting a school garden to start right away. We don't want anything to get in the way of that. Um, while your garden's growing, um, we decided that everybody should be uh, following some sort of composting regime. So we decided worm composting would be the most fun and aligns with so many um, science standards. So there is literally a worm composting lesson in almost every grade. Um, in our curriculum. So we spend a lot of time teaching about worm composting and so a, a worm composter and worms actually come with our turnkey kits. I mentioned the, um, the, the transplant delivery and here's sort of a, another snapshot of the scope of this. This is a really, um, really widespread effort and I could not, um, Megan and I could not do it without the master gardeners, without the 4-H extension agents, the horticulture agents, um, our community partners like Ben Sees, who goes out and delivers plants for us. Um, this is truly a labor of love, and hopefully everyone will see that it's meant um, to really ramp up school garden efforts across the state. We want to put our money where our mouth is. We also offer um, professional development. So if your school um, needs something special, you know, we could probably come up with it if we haven't already. Um, we do these summer workshops usually in person, and, and those are another part of our professional development um, offerings. So I didn't want to take up too much time today because I have so many great guests, but if you want to keep in touch with us, we are on Facebook at Clemson EXT School Community Gardening. We're on Instagram at STEM in the Garden. I've also listed the 4-H Extension um, website. Our Clemson Extension website's at the bottom. And um, we also have a blog that you can follow and you can join our mailing list. Although just by signing up for this webinar, we pretty much already put you on our mailing list. So if you don't want to be, you'll have to take yourself off or unsubscribe. So I will, uh, the next slide on here is, um, Three, oh, two, one. Hang yeah. on just one second. Um, sorry. Um, I had the opportunity to record our colleague Carolyn Lindstrom, the project manager, one of the project managers at MUSC Boeing Children's Center, uh, our Center for Children's Wellness earlier this week. And I told her that I would um, add her talk to my presentation and, um, and share. So I'm gonna turn this over to Carolyn and then um, I'm gonna be able to answer some questions and then we're gonna move on down the agenda. Good morning, everybody. My name is Carolyn Lindstrom. I am project manager with MUSC Boeing Center for Children's Wellness. I'm here to kind of just tell you guys a little bit about our organization, um, what school districts are working with, um, how we support school gardening, and then um, I'll introduce you guys to some of the resources we have um, related to physical activity and nutrition for schools. So... Our mission at MUSC Boeing Center for Children's Wellness, we are a grant funded program and we work with school districts in South Carolina um, on creating healthy learning environments through assisting schools with implementing targeted wellness initiatives. Our initiative is based off of the CDC whole school, whole community, whole child model. Um, so we of course, are very focused on making sure all students feel healthy, safe, engaged, supported, and challenged. And we do that by working in a coordinated school health environment effect. So focusing on physical activity, we um, also focus on the staff 
school because if the staff of the school aren't healthy and well and feeling good about themselves, how are they going to engage students in those behaviors and activities? Nutrition environment and services, health services, social emotional is a big piece of our initiative, especially for this coming school year. And then we work with our schools um, to embrace the community and um, the school gardens is a great example of kind of how we take some of those nutrition initiatives and embrace the community by partnering with Amy and Clemson Extension. So where we are located in the state, this is the list of current school districts and counties that we are working with. We are also going to be expanding to four to eight new school districts, which we're really excited about this year. So those are not on the map yet. We are just having conversations right now. So individual schools can't participate in our initiative. We go in on a school district level. So if you're a school teacher and you do not see your district listed right here, I'm putting up my contact information at the end. Um, we will be expanding, but we're really excited to work with Anderson 3 and 4 this year, both school districts in Bamberg, all of the school districts in Barnwell, Berkeley County, Charleston, Dorchester 2, Colleton, Clarendon School District 2, Greenwood 50, and Williamsburg County School District. Um, so I just want to show you guys that map. And then I talked a lot about partnerships and how we engage the community. Um, we do, MUSC and Clemson University have an official partnership called Healthy Me, Healthy SC Alliance. It's a collaborative project. We're currently working in Anderson County, Barnwell County, and Williamsburg County. And in these counties, we are partnering um, to actually fund school gardens. Um, so in our overall initiative, we highly encourage encourage schools to have gardens and assist them with resources and encourage the school garden training. In this specific partnership, we actually get to supply the funding uh, as well for the garden. So it's been a really great partnership with Clemson. This is going to be our third year. So here are some of a summary of some of the strategies our schools that participate in the overall initiative completed last year. Um, every school that participates and does a certain amount of wellness changes and activities receives anywhere from a $250 to a $1,000 wellness award. That wellness award is then given back to the wellness committee and schools can utilize those funds for more wellness changes at their schools this year. So last school year we gave out $140,000 across the state. Um, we had 144 schools do wellness programming for staff, 130 schools had healthcare professionals work with their school wellness committee to do even more wellness changes. Um, we had about 56% of our schools do gardens, 63% promote water drinking. Um, and once again, we're constantly working with schools to build those community partnerships to help them do more healthy activities. So I wanted to walk you guys through, because even if you are a school or a teacher, educator, not participating in our initiative, we have a bunch of great resources, and most of them are free on our website. So I recorded this to kind of walk you guys through. We are updating our website currently right now. That address is this, this website address right here. Um, will be the same, and um, I'm going to put it up at the end of the presentation as well. All right, I wanted to take everybody to um, just take a walk through our website really quickly because we have a lot of great resources um, to implement school wellness initiatives. So this is our website. I'll also put up the address at the Our mission and vision and checklist of resources. We have a lot of great resources for schools split up into different categories. So whether you're participating in our overall initiative with the school wellness checklist or not, all of these resources can still be applicable to your school. We have some resources on forming a school wellness committee, and then you can see all the different wellness areas here. So if you go to nutrition, and you click down in the wall of the there's some team fitness resources. Every single kind of topic area has a click down to so go to what school gardening resources we'll be adding to, our different school spaces, etc. So, um, physical activity, social emotional well being, um, culture, there are a lot of different public policy, social work, and health tips, different health delivery strategies for your school, and also some ways to engage parents in your school wellness initiative. Wellness section as well. So, um, once again, whether your school is participating in our initiative or not, all of these 
courses are either free or a very low cost um, to implement. They are open to anybody. And then if you go back to our We also have a list of virtual resources. So if any of your school districts are starting off the year virtually, these are resources that both teachers and parents implement. Specifically on how to meet their social and emotional well-being and the importance of healthy nutrition while at home. So we're going to be updating as our other resources for this school year sometime next month. So um, make sure to come back and check it out. Okay. And another way you guys can connect with us, we are on Facebook and Instagram um, at MUSC Boeing Center. We share a lot of great resources and different opportunities for both the community and um, educators as well to kind of stay engaged in different resources promoting physical activity, nutrition, and social emotional well-being. And here is my direct contact information. Um, there is my email address, boeingcenter.musc.edu, goes to our entire team. Um, we have a team of three other coordinators and our assistant director and our marketing and communications coordinator. Um, so if you have any general questions about the program, you can ask there. And then there is our website link again. And I appreciate the time and look forward to hopefully connecting with some of you. And everyone stay safe and well. Thank you, Carolyn. We missed seeing you today. <laughs> um, I didn't want to also take a moment to introduce our, um, I didn't introduce him earlier. I wasn't sure if he'd be able to join us today. Our, um, our program team leader for horticulture, Corey Tanner is with us today. You may be seeing him as, um, as one of the panelists. And um, so Ben, our right, Ben Cease from Department of Ed, are you ready to share your screen? Can you share your screen? <laughs> yeah, get, apparently not. Give me one sec. Okay, if you need me to, um, let me see if I need to go back and I'll make you the host. How about that? No, nah, it should be working. Okay, oh yeah, perfect. Okay. Can you everybody see that? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm going to mute myself now for so you can. All right, well, I'm going to jump through a lot of information. Again, thank you all for joining us today. Um, just let me get set up again real quick. Uh, my name's Ben Cease. I work for the South Carolina Department of Education Office of Health and Nutrition. Uh, I coordinate uh, farm to school programs uh, that range from a junior chef uh, project to a school garden project and some other things too that I'll go through. I'm gonna touch on some uh, history of the program and then talk about things resources that we offer and uh, a school garden program that we put out every year that'll come out in October, but I'll get into more detail about that and then also do a little overview of grants in general and some uh, federal state and just get you thinking about various grants uh, all the way around. But again, um, Farm to School started in 2011 uh, with the Department of Agriculture, South Carolina DHEC, Clemson, DSS, and Department of Education in a collaborative effort. Uh, it evolved over the years. We were a mini grant program where we funded a lot of school gardens. A big part of Farm to School is getting more local produce in the school food system. Uh, at the Office of Health and Nutrition. I work with other programs in my office like the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program, the Summer Food Service Program, and uh, just to get more fruits and vegetables into summer uh, feeding sites and the school system. So it's evolved over the years. We became a farm and institution program in 2015 and expanded into uh, other retail institutions, child care centers, Department of Juvenile Justice. Um, those efforts expanded and went and like I said, food banks and the other retail markets. And recently we've kind of uh, retracted a little bit. The Department of Agriculture is our administering agency. We're a part of the National Farm to School Network and 
uh, Clemson Department of Education and Department of Agriculture are pretty much uh, what Farm to School is now. Um, but we 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 have a lot of partners, share a lot of information. Um, again, I mentioned the National Farm to School Network. There's a lot of resources on their website and in the email that was sent out this morning, there's all kinds of links and things that you can go into to do your own research. Um, <clears throat> again, this is a national movement. There's a lot of uh, different funding being uh, channeled through federal sites and institutions. And again, I'm gonna talk about that in a second. But uh, we have a website, just to talk about the state resources, we have a website, uh, SouthCarolinaFarmToSchool.com. We have resources for teachers, food service, as well as farmers, again, to try to connect the local community. And, uh, you know, the food system's complicated, so it takes a lot of effort and partnerships and communication to make it work properly. So. Again, we're just trying to share resources and connect those dots. Um, so we have a newsletter. I, I don't really harp on this a lot. I'm going to uh, send out a chat link that you can see. I'm going to try to. I think it'll work. Uh, so you can sign up for our newsletter. I'm not going to sign you up. I want you to go on there and sign up if you want. But I'll uh, aggregate a lot of different information monthly. Um, It'll revolve around what grants are coming down the pipeline. We have Palmetto Pick of the Month program that I'm going to talk about in a second. Any kind of upcoming trainings or partner grants. Uh, we highlight success stories. So if you're doing a good job out in the district, you know, I might not hear about it. Uh, I would love to share your story. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's a big part of uh, what we're trying to do at Farm to School is share you alls story because we know a lot of people are doing a lot of hard work uh, in, in school districts and we want to highlight that and, and you know give you some props because we know it's not easy, especially in today's world. Um, but again, we have a good Facebook page. I share all this information. You can connect with all this later. Um, and I'm still gonna try to add this, uh, I don't know why this is popping up. I had it all set up the chat. But I'll, I'll do it when I'm done, um, just for the sake of time, I'm gonna move forward. Uh, again, I mentioned the Department of Agriculture. Uh, I work closely with uh, Katie Pfeiffer and Betsy Dorton. They've been farm to school coordinators and now war Kate McAllister. Uh, there's a certified SC Grown uh, partnership for farm to school that you become an associate member. Uh, you can access it through a website, tell us, you know, what you're growing at your school or what you serve at your school cafeteria. And um, we can get you these logos because a big part of, again, what we're trying to do is promote local and uh, farming's hard work. We want to support the farmers. We want to get kids understanding that they need to support the farmers by however they can go to the farmer's market or, you know, uh, go out and meet a farmer, have a farmer at your school, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm gonna start into the things that my office kind of offers. Um, I'm gonna start in October uh, because October is National Farm to School Month. Again, this is a national movement. Um, this is a great time to celebrate uh, Farm to School by having a taste test. Uh, we do a Make Your Plate Grown Week. Um, I won't go into detail about that, but we offer resources and a toolkit every year around October that you get helps you uh, plan and uh, celebrate Farm to School Month. So part of that from my office is the School Garden and Education Assistance Program. Again, partnership with Clemson and uh, the School and Community Garden Group has been amazing. The Garden STEM curriculum and their uh, gardening program and training and all the 4-H agents that help with this are amazing. Um, so we sponsor their program. Uh, 20 schools each year receive the School Gardening for SE Educators program. We'll get a school gardening kit. Um, there's a, a application and a scoring rubric. So we always have a lot more than we can uh, give 
uh, unfortunately. So we limit it to 20 a year. We started this a couple years ago. Um, the only requirement for this uh, little grant is you can't have gotten it before. Well, there's two. If you're on this list, you can't get it again. I'm gonna show another slide in a second. There's 40 schools that can't get it at this point. And you also have to be participating in the National School Lunch Program. So if you have a question, if, if you do participate in the National School Lunch Program, uh, just talk to your food service director, your school, uh, your kitchen manager, they should be able to tell you if you do or don't. Um, most public schools do, a lot of private schools do, uh, charter schools, et cetera. So it, it just depends. So here's the second year. I'm gonna show this and uh, breeze through this. And if you, again, unfortunately, if you're on this list, you will not be able to apply for the program that I just uh, mentioned. Um, the application, again, will be shared through all kinds of streams, social media, newsletter, uh, Department of Education's website is where the application will be found. And that should come out in October of 2020. Um, so, uh, any questions about that, feel free to reach out and contact me. Uh, and that goes as far as anything that I talk about on this slideshow. Uh, again, this is another thing that we do in October. The first time was last year. Um, this is all contingent on the school year, obviously, but we do a junior chef competition. It's a regional competition. There's a lot of scholarship money that goes with this competition to go to school at a culinary school in Kentucky. Uh, the United States Department of Agriculture is a big uh, part of this junior chef competition. Um, there's a regional competition again every year. Uh, this is for Kate, uh, age students or high school culinary programs. So uh, what I talked about with the school gardening program earlier, um, that's open for anybody in the National School Lunch Program, K through 12. We've had some K schools apply. They haven't gotten it yet. Um, again, there's needs-based applied with free and reduced rates and a lot of uh, scoring that goes into that application. But um, again, this junior chef competition is strictly for culinary older K and high school K twelve uh, nine through twelve age kids. Um, again, reach out to me if you have any questions. That comes out in October every year too. Um, so moving on, we award the gardens. We'll come back and do trainings. Uh, this is another thing that we do in the spring. Again. As I mentioned, we, we try to get a lot of local produce into the school systems and connect farmers and buyers at different levels. Uh, I work with Katie Pfeiffer, you know her, she puts this together for the most part, Laura Kate and Katie at the Department of Ag. And uh, this is a great, great meeting. Uh, it's at the Farmer's Market in West Columbia every year. We've done it. Uh, three years now, this will be our fourth year in March and it just keeps getting better. So again, keep that on, on the docket as well. Um, as I mentioned, uh, out of my office, we have various programs that feed kids. Uh, one is the, the um, summer feeding program. Uh, this year was a little different with COVID. Uh, I get out and do a lot of programming with summer feeding sites. Uh, a lot of private sites as well as schools. So that's one resource that I offer. I can come out and I bring a lot of plants and just do a good uh, little horticulture lesson for the kids uh, through the summer, um, just teach them where their food comes from essentially. Um, so again, if you're interested in me coming out to a summer feeding site, I'd be glad to just reach out to me. Um, so just to transition, I'm going to run through just a little bit about, about grants uh, from a federal level, state level, and uh, just a, a business organization, nonprofit level as well, and how you can find some resources around grant writing, because everybody needs funding, obviously. Um, and again, not everybody will be lucky if you're trying to get a school garden to get into the school garden education assistance program. So you got to think other ways. And 
the reason I show this schematic is really about partnerships because um, you, you can see K through 12 is all the way on the right side of your screen. There's only three grants there for, for K through 12 schools. However, if you partner with a higher edu education institution or a business or a nonprofit or a state agency or a local farmer or a local government or soil and water, et cetera, et cetera, all of this opens up. Um, you know, there's the food and nutrition services grants, all for farm to school grants, uh, American Agriculture Marketing Service, National Institute of Food and Agriculture, EPA offers a lot of healthy learning environments uh, grants. There's so many federal grants. Again, I, I don't want to get too deep into it, but uh, there's money out there. You, you really have to think big picture. Uh, they're not going to give a federal grant to one school. You got to have a partnership and district-wide programming. So I know this is kind of uh, maybe above some of you where you are in your school gardening and, and farm and school programs right now, but just want you to start thinking outside the box. And uh, again, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, the USDA Farm to School Grant is a, one that I'm directly tied to. Uh, equipment assistant grants in um, your cafeterias, if you're in the National School Lunch Program, we administer that at the Department of Education. There's opportunities there and many community facilities grants if you can tap into a partnership, especially with cities. Um, so just to talk about the USDA Farm to School Planning Grant real quick. Again, you just, you can, these are for beginning programs that are just starting out. Um, if you wanna put 12 school gardens at, uh, you know, throughout the district, this is a good one. The implementation is a good one for that too. But I guess my point is you really can uh, mold your program however you want to. If you want to do it around food waste, uh, Lexington Richland 5 received a six-figure grant this year almost to uh, prop up their food, uh, food waste and recycling programs in the district. And they got it specifically from this USDA Farm to School grant. $12 million went into the net uh, throughout the nation. Uh, the Department of Agriculture and Department of Education got one of these grants this year to do a procurement pilot program and develop a cookbook for food service. Um, Charleston, County schools received this grant this year, again, almost $100,000 to work more with their urban schools and create gardens. And again, I think they're doing some food waste and working with Green Heart Foundation. So again, if you, you wanna um, expand your horizons, look into this grant, there's a lot of money going into it. And there's two different tracks, a planning grant and implementation grant. The planning grants range uh, up to fifty thousand dollars again, and these are planning grants. So if you you got resources in your district, I highly recommend looking into some of these grants because just more and more money is going into them. Um, again, implementation grants is what all three entities in South Carolina this year received: uh, infrastructure, food safety, curriculum, um, just the, the world is your oyster when it comes to what you want to do. Um, and these go up to $100,000. There is a match, I will say, for most of these federal grants, but a lot of that can come from in-kind funds like uh, a non-federal teacher's salary, for instance. So uh, there's ways collaterally and in-kind that you can match these grants. So moving on. Uh, where do I go for money? Um, again, uh, DHEC, Department of Education, Department of Agriculture, Soil and Water, it really depends on where you are in the state. You have to kind of feel your way and find out who is there for you to work with. And, and some people will want to work with you and some people won't. And that's just the way it is. A lot of local businesses, think about Ace Hardware, Lowe's, Tractor Supply, uh, mom and pops, you know, they want to support just like they used to support old, you know, baseball teams and kids leagues. They, they'll do this for gardens and other things like this. 
Um, the South Carolina State Library has tremendous resources uh, for grant writing, and now all their trainings and webinars are online uh, through this website, um, their website or this link that you will receive in the email earlier. Again, there's all kinds of online webinars and tutorials. You can access their foundation grant directory uh, and their great uh, assistance, technical assistance as far as grant writing. Um, there's seven state library branches around the state. Um, this one in particular is in Columbia. You'll just have to reach out to them. Um, but again, this website has a lot of trainings on, online. So again, I just want you, this one's old, but just I always put this up there because it's a good one. Richland County Soil and Water does a good job with their mini grant program. This may not be available everywhere in the state, but uh, just to get you to start thinking about these folks that you have, you know, like-minded goals and like-minded agendas. So um, Soil and Water, uh, Department of Natural Resources, even Forest, um, all these smart kids I always like to advertise this one again I know I saw a lot of uh, old faces so this is old news to some people that are on this webinar but uh, this is a good one it ranges from a hundred to five thousand dollars about physical activity nutrition education uh, you can incorporate arts in this Aldi is expanding like uh, crazy and they are funding and giving back to the community so you just have to put an idea on paper and uh, get it out there and see what happens you you might get funded uh, another thing I talk about Palmetto Pride if you haven't heard about it um, they do a lot of beautification and tree grants for schools uh, reach out to these folks um, depending on what you're trying to do part of that is uh, school gardens uh, they can't fund everybody, but this is a good uh, route, and they're a South Carolina organization, so um, it's going to be easier to contact and, and get funded through some of these folks. Uh, I always like to give props to the Champions of the Environment and DHEX Recycling Grants. Um, you'll hear more about that uh, coming up. Uh, there might be some changes, I'm not sure, but I'm not going to go into detail, but uh, again, Champions of the Environment, Recycling Grants, DHEC is a good resource to go to. Um, and these are some other ones, just these are more competitive national organizations, Kids Gardening, Whole Kids, Captain Planet, Aldi Smart Kids, which I mentioned. Um, there are just numerous, so much information out there. And these are competitive grants and they're national, but uh, there's other resources and you'll find a lot of good information on these sites and these links are out there. So um, I don't know what I'm looking at on time, but I think I went through that pretty quick. I don't know if there's any questions, but again, feel free to reach out to me as things normalize. You know, I come out to a lot of schools for career days or wellness events or science fairs. Uh, that's such a fun part of my job that I miss. So please keep me in mind if you ever have anything down the line. Um, I would love to come and uh, set up a table for farm to school at any of your events. So um, I always like to do a few jokes. And again, none of these are new, so I apologize. And they're very corny. So uh, real quick, I'm going to go through a couple jokes. Uh, what do you call an alligator in a vest? And feel, feel free to do the chat here. Um, and if you know it already, don't do it, please. Anybody out there? What happened to my chat? All right, what do you call an alligator in a vest? An investigator. Ha ha ha. Why should you net always knock on the fridge door before opening it? Why should you always knock on the fridge door before you open it? And I put these up here because they're corny and you know, they're, if you ever want to use them, you're going to get this PowerPoint and uh, they're good for kids. In case there's a salad dressing, I like that one. 
and everybody's heard this why did the plungy leave the party he's out of here there wasn't much room that's not that's maybe older kid appropriate and last but not least why what do you get if you cross an angry sheep and a moody cow you get an animal that's in a bad mood okay <laughs> never you never disappoint with that one all right yeah i know i, I got to come up with some new ones so i apologize y'all but again thanks for my time thank you for being here and uh reach out to me if you have any questions about anything that i talk about please awesome thank you uh ben you have a few q and a's to answer um okay we switch gears so yes. i'll again. try to find my chat again so bear with me i okay issues all right Tracy Miss Kelly can you share your screen do you have what you need to do that I hope yes I do okay welcome thank you let me get this okay here we are thank you for having me today Amy I'm so excited to be here I wasn't able to be on the last um, so webinar you managed to do something in the last webinar that we all want to be able to do y'all tracy figured out how to be in two places at once <laughs> sort of like carolyn uh Lindstrom did today um and i want to just give you uh, a shout out for that it went really well we missed you in person but um people were really excited to see you nonetheless and we're happy to have you live and in person today yes i'm excited to be here i was actually you know i hated to miss and so um you know i did record that because I feel like we have valuable information to share, but I was learning all about oyster farming that day and it was so interesting. So shout out to Barrier Island Oyster Company because those guys are, are awesome at what they do and taught me so much because we don't always think about aquaculture in the realm of agriculture, but I'm Tracy Muskelly, um, as Amy has said, and I'm the director of South Carolina Farm Bureau Ag in the Classroom. And um, I'm a former classroom teacher. I have taught um, kindergarten, first, second, and third grades, and I've also been a school-based literacy coach. So I will be talking to you about reading and books because I do love to read. Um, you heard me say insurance. I promise, though, I'm not here to sell you insurance. Although, if you do have uh, South Carolina Farm Bureau insurance, then you are a member of the South Carolina Farm Bureau Federation. And um, this is our president, Mr. Harry Ott. He is the sixth Farm Bureau president. Um, he was elected to this position in 2015. Um, before that, Mr. Ott um, was actually a teacher. He started out as a high school math teacher and um, he and his brother are row crop farmers in Calhoun County. So Mr. Ott is a farmer, um, which makes him extremely capable of doing this job. But I really enjoy the fact that he was an educator and he also has policy experience. He was a member of the South Carolina House of Representatives for quite a number of years. Um, he was actually appointed by the Obama administration to be the state director of the Farm Service Agency. So he has a really diverse background. But what is Farm Bureau? Like I said, I'm not here to sell you insurance. I represent the agriculture side, the Federation. And so this is a grassroots organization um, that is vested in advocating for agriculture and rural communities across South Carolina, while also being respectful of the needs of all citizens so um, you know we want to advocate um, for rural South Carolina but not at the detriment of any of our other industries or residents so a little bit about Farm Bureau I have to give a shout out to Amy because this is a grassroots organization it starts at the local level we have uh, 47 volunteer leader boards across the state uh, one in every county and two in Horry County and Amy is actually a member of the Charleston County um, Farm Bureau Board of Directors so shout out to Amy but what is uh, Ag in the Classroom so this organization is a separate entity from Farm Bureau it's a 501c3 but it is under the Farm Bureau umbrella 
It started in the 1980s by the United States Department of Agriculture because more and more folks were moving away from the farm and um, stakeholders were noticing that um, people did not know where their food or fiber comes from. You know, I hear it all even still today that potatoes grow on trees, that brown milk comes from a brown cow. It's just all kinds of craziness that eggs are dairy. No, they are not dairy. I know they're near the dairy aisle, but they are not a dairy product. So this was chartered. We have our national organization, National Ag in the Classroom, and then in all 50 states, there is a point of contact. So in our state, um, I am that person and I'm associated with the Farm Bureau, and it's that way in about half of the states. But in the other 50 states, or in the other half, I should say, um, there are that person may be associated with its land grant university like Clemson or SC State here in South Carolina or with its state department of ag. But all of our missions are the same and that is to increase agricultural literacy. So helping those folks understand where their food and fiber comes from. And we do work with students, but our main mission is to work with educators because we have seen through the past that when we educate the educators, we have a greater impact um, because then they are able to go back and educate their students. So why is agriculture important? Why are we talking about this day? Well, I hope that you've all eaten breakfast or something today. Um, that is why it's relevant. Also, um, you know, there's a lot of research on project-based learning and, and STEM and all of these hot topics in education. And I don't feel like there's any uh, greater STEM problem to solve or, or using STEM um, as a learning experience than agriculture. Because this graphic here shows you um, just how ag has changed. So in the late 1800s, early 1900s, the average American farmer fed about 10 people, which we know about family size. I mean, my grandmother had 17 brothers and sisters. Like we had kids like crazy, right? That was probably their immediate family. Today's American farmer on average feeds 155 to 165 people. So our farmers are doing more than they've ever done before. Now, I live in York County, one of the fastest growing counties in the state, and I see land developed every single day. There's construction going on. We even have moratoriums on growth in parts of our county because it's so fast. Now, we have less arable land. We have more people on this planet than we've ever had before. Some experts are saying we're gonna hit nine to 10 billion in the next 30 years less arable land, more people to feed, that's a STEM problem for our students to solve. And I believe students can solve this, you know, they're our future. Farmers are less than 2% of the population in America. So it's a big job. And this is relevant, just like I said, hopefully you've eaten today. Um, I had some cheesecake with my coffee. No, that's not very healthy, but it was really good. Um, but I've taught in a lot of various settings. Most of the schools I've taught in have been Title I, very high populations of free and reduced lunch. And even though food may be scarce in those populations or whether food is abundant in a population, I feel like this is relevant to students. You know, we're always, or our students are always asking, you know, why do I need to know this? Well, knowing where your food and fiber comes from is pretty important, especially if, you know, we need to find how to provide it for ourselves. Thankfully, we have those one and a half percent of the population farmers that are producing for us, but what if that's not happening? Um, so it's, it's an interesting conversation to have. Agriculture is a $42 billion a year industry in South Carolina, supports over 212,000 jobs. So I'm talking about, yes, the producers and growers, but also those that are involved in equipment sales or seed sales or um, financial institutions like Ag South. I'm sorry if you hear my dog barking. <laughs> my child is here today. My dog is playing with a child, so I may have to step off and go and 
tell them to climb. The same boat, this is this is real. This is real like work from home life. It's just chaotic. So, um, goodness gracious, five million acres still in farmland, which is about twenty five percent of our land mass in South Carolina. But unfortunately, like I said, being developed all the time. This is our commodities map. Um, hold on one second. Let me tell them. I'm just going to have to tell my daughter. God forbid that FedEx person ring the doorbell while you're doing a talk. Right. But then the dogs go nuts. And it does. It's, it's insane. Crazy. You're fine. We're all used to it. Carry I on. I normally <laughs> have child care. I do not today, which means my dog is here playing with my five-year-old. It's just insane. And I'm just going to go ahead and say shout out to all the educators on here that are going to have to deal with their own children at home and educating this fall. I know how hard being in the classroom is, so trying to handle all of that, I'm just pr praying and you are my thoughts because what a task you have in front of you. Um, but this is our commodities map. It is on our um, website, free as a PDF. And I just like to show this because of the diversity of ag in South Carolina. And you know, we have a very diverse landscape. I, feel so lucky to live here because I live right up in York County and I can be in the mountains in two hours. Or I can be down to see Amy in about three hours in Charleston. But that also means that we have diverse um, industry within agriculture. You see most of our livestock is in the upstate. Well, why is that? Because land up here isn't very conducive to row crop planting and it's very, uh, uh, you know, mountainous terrain, so that's better for livestock. Well, here around the I-95 corridor where our land is very flat, you see all of our row crops here, cotton, corn, peanuts. Um, and then of course, we have the aquaculture and mariculture industry on the coast, which I love fresh seafood. But as I've been learning, about 90% of our seafood is imported into the United States. So when you go to Publix or Bilo or anywhere, normally you'll find that most of the shrimp that they're carrying is actually imported from China, which is very interesting to me. So support local if you can, because there are a lot of guys and gals on the coast that are trying to move their products right now. Um, what do we offer? So first thing, curriculum. We have lesson plans. Lots of free, yes I said free, lesson plans. Um, you can go to the National Ag in the Classroom website, Ag Classroom. Lots of lesson plans there aligned to national standards like Next Generation Science Standards or um, Common Core. Very uh, in detail, I mean, but you think the long range lesson plans that you had to write in college if you were an education major, I mean, very, anybody can pick it up and do it. So also they include several activities. So some of these lessons can be broken down into almost a, like a mini unit, several days worth of things. Um, we also offer lesson plans on our website, scfb.org backslash AITC. Those will actually be aligned to South Carolina state learning standards and we're trying to build um, that database up. And then American Farm Bureau has lesson plans and resources, and I'm not going to go through all of those websites. Um, you'll have access to this presentation, um, but please navigate and, you know, check out what all there is available because there's a lot of things that are free where you can integrate agriculture into math, science, social studies all across the curriculum. We also um, will eventually, when COVID can subside, have a mobile learning lab that will be available to K-5 elementary schools um, across South Carolina, and that will be almost an on-site field trip. Having been in the classroom, field trips can be so expensive um, for schools, and it's just not an option. So we wanted to bring the farm to the school, and this will be an opportunity. A teacher will travel with this trailer for, um, 
your students to experience agriculture hands-on. And also we have some pretty neat technology that's gonna come along with this. Um, we're actually creating 3D um, or 360 videos right now where students will wear VR goggles and actually be on the farm and see and actually have access to things like poultry houses that they wouldn't necessarily get to be inside of, but they'll be able to see um, the whole process and actually see like from the hatchery all the way to production. So it's pretty cool. Please check that out. I told you I was going to talk about books because I love reading. We started an initiative last year called Book of the Month. Um, we feature an ag accurate children's book every month. Basically that means one where there's not talking animals and portrays ag life correctly. And we sell those for $5. I will say all of these books retail over $5 and our goal is not to make money here. We don't make money on this initiative. We just try to offer a low cost resource to, to teachers. We pair these with lesson plans. This is the first page of one of our lesson plans and we post them on our website. So let's say you already have one of these books. You don't have to purchase the book. You can go on our website um, and download the PDF. Those, again, are aligned to South Carolina State Learning Standards. So I'm so glad um, that we have a lot of partners around the state, like this book right here retails for $17.99. We were still offering it for $5. Um, that is because of gener generous partnerships with places like Walther Farms, or there have been several other farmers that have donated to this program so that we continue to offer this low cost. You can also subscribe for the year if you wanna make sure that you get a book because once we sell out in that month, it's sold out. We do not order again. Um, so if you do the subscription, then you're guaranteed a book. We did have to take a break because of COVID, but books were sent out on Tuesday for August. We are back rolling. Um, with this initiative and so really excited about this month's book. It's called Auntie Yang's Great Soybean Picnic. It's all about um, Chinese culture and family and community building and also soybean. So a really cute um, book to share with your students and then some hands-on activities to do as well. We also offer professional development. We've have hosted virtual workshops across the summer. I was looking at the attendee list and I see some folks on here that are familiar. So I'm glad that you guys had decided to join Amy today, but we offer um, normally in-person trainings and we always include a farm tour because that's such rich um, conversation that you can have when you take educators to the farm and, and really get that hands-on learning. So. Next summer, hopefully we'll get to do that again. Um, National Eye in the Classroom also has a wonderful conference every summer that includes workshops or seminars that you can attend and also farm tours. Next year's conference is in Des Moines, Iowa. So I'm pretty excited about that. You get to see what other um, states agriculture looks like, but also collaborating with teachers, K-12 teachers across, um, across the country. And that's not limited to just um, public school teachers. I mean, there are 4-H um, extension agents that attend. Some of our Farm Bureau volunteers attend. So this is not just an educator only conference as far as public school educators. And then American Farm Bureau also offers professional development. Um, one in particular they offer for free because it's paid for by beef checkoff dollars. So paid in part by the Beef uh, f Cattle Farmers of America. And this is an opportunity for you to learn all about beef production, basically from farm to plate. And it's really interesting. And like I said, free because it's paid for by those cattle farmers, but you have to be accepted into that to get access to that um, professional development. But they also offer other things, again, because of COVID, they've been offering virtual opportunities, so, and those have been free. So please check out their website. Again, this is a grassroots organization. So there are volunteers all across the state that are interested in helping um, teach children about agriculture that may be volunteering their time. Maybe they have resources. Um, lots of county farm bureaus are interested in helping um, teachers with acquiring resources. This is one of our lovely volunteers from Darlington County. Her and her family are, are fourth generation cotton farmers and they actually are uh, produce blankets from their own cotton and this all happens uh, between the Carolinas. They're um, 
called Covered in Cotton, and basically they are on a mission to not only produce um, items from their from their production of cotton, but they also give back to children's hospitals. So every 10 blankets that are sold, they give one back. But Tracy is here teaching students about cotton because you would be surprised. Most students don't understand that it grows on a plant and they're wearing mostly cotton every day. It's the um, most highly used fabric in the world, but really showing them the steps of how this gets to uh, be that t-shirt or that pair of jeans is really interesting. And um, she's actually talking at a school in Darlington County, but lots of folks like that around the state. All you have to do is reach out to me and I can try to, um, connect you with them. We also try to uh, reward teachers that are trying to integrate agriculture. Betty J. DeWitt um, is a former uh, state women's leadership committee chair and she was also an educator and so this was created in her honor and basically um, you submit an application. Those are open now. They will be due um, by October 1st. And this person will receive a cash prize of $1,000, an expense paid trip to our annual convention to be recognized. And then you also get an expense paid trip to that national Ag in the Classroom conference. So it's a really nice prize. And this is um, an application where obviously you'll tell about yourself, but also show how in your classroom you've integrated agriculture. But I highly recommend any of you, I mean, school gardens, that's integrating agriculture into your classroom. So apply for this um, Outstanding Educator Award. We also offer mini grants. Um, we select four recipients a year for $500 mini grants. And this goes from anything from um, school gardens to vermiculture to, I mean, you might be trying to integrate honey bees or have an observation hive, whatever, or maybe you just want to add to your ag accurate um, literacy collection in your classroom. All of those are acceptable applications and they will be also due by October 1st this year, but you can find those on our website. I tried to speed through that, Amy. <laughs> so that I can keep you on track. But most um, of what Ag in the Classroom is, is basically trying to help teachers and educators and our volunteers understand how important this industry is. Um, I love this quote, I share it um, every time I present, but we all, once in our life, may need a doctor, a lawyer, a policeman, or a preacher, but every day, three times a day, we need farmers. So. I know I just vomited a lot of information at you, but again, like I said, this presentation will be available for you to look um, through, and please look through and browse some of those websites, because there is a lot of free resources out there, free, 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 um, and even some low-cost opportunities, professional development, whatever, but um, keep us in mind. Like us on Facebook, SC Ag in the Classroom. We always share fun tidbits or things that are going on. So that's a good way to um, keep up with us or just email me. And I will include that in the chat if Amy hasn't already done so. But please um, just reach out to me if you have any questions and try to teach agriculture. Tracy, thank you so much. Awesome. You did a great job. I think everybody is super excited. And um, I dropped in the chat box that the folks that are left at the end, um, we're going to be giving away door prizes like we always do. And we always give away a year long subscription to the book of the month club. So some lucky winner today is going to get that for their classroom. Um, so it's a, a coveted grand prize, if you will. So we're grateful for you. And I'll let the cat out of the bag that you're going on vacation tomorrow from work. So enjoy your time off. Thank you. I'm glad we could be one of your last stops uh, before you get a little well-deserved time off from your busy, busy summer. So we'll see you uh, very soon, I hope. And um, so we're going to just take a little break now and we're going to give our... Um, our friends uh, Ada and Amanda an opportunity to get their screens all set up and everybody can go grab a snack, uh, grab a bottle of water, whatever you're doing this morning um, and then we'll be right back to get started. So um, it is uh, nine after 12 right now and we'll start back at 1215 right on the nose. Okay, Amanda, uh, Ada, is that okay with y'all? Works great for us. We'll see y'all at 1215. Okay, thank you.
Well, five minutes flies by. Huh? <laughs> Amanda, I'll let you and Ada just start whenever you're ready. It's about 12, 14 now. So maybe give everybody like a few more seconds to get back to, you know, until it's right at 12, 15, but um, and you guys can take it away. All right, Amy, you ready for us? Yes, ma'am. Let's go. You're people, you've got a big audience waiting. <laughs> All right, we're ready. We're so excited to be on today. And thanks to you, Amy, and Clemson Extension. Well, we are so appreciative of this partnership. And of course, to our friend Ben over at the South Carolina Department of Education, Office of Health and Nutrition. Um, we love working with y'all and again, we're just excited to be on. We're gonna talk a little bit about reducing food waste in school and community gardens. Of course, this can also apply to you at home. So if, if neither of those are in your wheelhouse today, that's okay. Everything we're gonna talk about are things that everyone can do. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about us, I am Amanda Edwards and with me I have Ada Gordon, and we are in the same room, so you won't see our faces today, but you'll get to see our slides, and we have some cool videos, um, and you'll get to meet us right now. There we are. We're going to take a really quick trip through the garden at my house, <laughs> and you can see I need to pull some weeds, but we have some tomatoes, we've got some peppers, um, we've got some onions, we've got a lot of cool things going. Um, so just so you'll know, everything that we are telling you about today are things that we have in fact tried ourselves. And if we can do it, we assure you anyone can do it. Um, but what is Don't Waste Food SC? Let me tell you a little bit about that too. Ada and I co-managed the Don't Waste Food SC campaign, which is housed out of South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Controls, Office of Solid Waste Reduction and Recycling. I will not try to say that again quickly. <laughs> um, we do have the manager of the Office of Solid Waste um, Reduction and Recycling on with us, Richard Chesley. Hi, Richard. Uh, so anyway, but Don't Waste Food is a collaborative campaign that DHEC is leading, but includes quite a few partners, as well as ambassadors. And we're gonna tell you about some ambassadors towards the end. We focus on three main pillars in Don't Waste Food SC. Those are prevention, donation, <laughs> and composting. Y'all got a sneak peek. Um, so the three pillars that our campaign is centered on are taken straight from the EPA's food recovery hierarchy. We just picked the three things that we thought were easiest to do that literally everyone can have some part in. Um, there are a few things that you can see here that we don't typically cover as often or as thoroughly as we do prevention, donation, and composting. But we do get a ton, a ton of questions about feeding food that we aren't gonna eat to animals. Uh, generally, we defer to the Department of Agriculture, but in this instance, um, if you're at home and you have some vegetables that you are starting to look a little sad, there are lots of dogs like uh, my dog Leroy, who enjoy a nice cool cucumber in the middle of the summer. Just for his safety, be sure to do a quick Google search. Uh, dog can eat, fill in the blank, <laughs> just to make sure that it's okay for him to eat. Yeah. So the things that we're gonna focus on out of the three pillars that we mentioned that we typically do, which is prevention, donation, and composting again, today we're only gonna focus on two of those primarily, and that's gonna be prevention and composting. Uh, before we get started in really talking more about that, we're gonna do a fun poll. So I'm gonna give you, and but this one's not gonna be a webinar poll. This one you're gonna do from your cell phone. You can also do it on the web if that's easier for you, but I know for us, it's a little hard to multitask web and webinar. So just go on your smartphone and type in 22333, that's the number you're gonna text, 
and you're gonna send the message Romy Tomato 145. So if you'll go ahead and take care of that, um, this is anonymous, so we're gonna get you to answer a question. All right, ready? So we'll, we'll give you guys a second to do that. Um, once you do that first step that Amanda just said, uh, text Romy Tomato 145 to that number, you'll get a little response message um, saying something like you're able to to answer the poll or um, your presenter has not opened the poll yet. So if you give us just a second, let's go ahead and activate that guy. Cool, so what is your favorite food to grow in your garden or to make from things that you've grown in your garden? Use your emoji to answer this one. It'll be way more fun if you don't use the keyboard, just use your emojis. <laughs> Very cool. And you can definitely answer more than once, guys. So we have a couple of things popping up, as you can see. Um, tomatoes is a hit, strawberries are a hit. I don't know why the spicy peppers show up like that, but that's my favorite thing to grow too. We've got cucumbers, sweet potatoes, corn. We're just gonna give it a couple more seconds for you to get your, all right, cool. So uh, as you can see, we got quite a bit of fresh produce listed on there, which is awesome. That's what we wanted. So let's talk about how to preserve all the fruits of your labor from your home, school, or community garden. The most important thing when you're in the garden to preserve your food that you're growing is to know what it is that you're growing. Um, I'm a big experimenter. I like to try something new every season but I have learned the hard way a couple of times that in order not to waste a bunch of food or the life of that beautiful plant, what I need to do is a bunch of research beforehand. Um, if, if you're not a gardener, which I'm, I'm not gonna call anybody out except for maybe Richard Chesley, um, I know you're not a big gardener. So there's a big difference between say a tomato plant and a cucumber plant um, and they need different things outside of you know the typical water, sunlight, and good soil. And if you need more information on plants and how what is native to the area and what grows best where, we're gonna defer you back to Amy and her team over at Clemson Extension. Um, but knowing what you grow is really the first step in preventing waste in your own garden. And of course, we said we weren't going to talk about this much, but we do want to at least mention that food donation is an option. We get a lot of questions. Is it legal? Can I do it? What if I get sued? Um, so donating food is not only um, approved, so to speak, by DHEC, but it is also encouraged. And that, of course, is with following food safety guidelines. If your garden it has a bumper crop and you want to share some of that, check with your local food bank or shelter to see if they can take fresh produce. If that's not an option, um, share it with your neighbor or find out from your school if there is a way that you can share it there. Okay, I'm gonna talk about this one because this photo is actually a picture from my kitchen. And this is one of my favorite quotes of all time. It says, as long as you live, keep learning how to live. And that's from the Roman Stoic Seneca. If you know me, you know that I talk about the Stoics way too much. Um, but this is actually a really exciting picture for me because I'm a huge fan of canning and preserving and making things and growing things, but I've never had the guts to try a jelly before because I was so afraid it wouldn't set and I'd end up with this soupy mess. But after watching the, um, the webinar a couple weeks ago about canning and preserving fruits and vegetables and other things, I tried my hand at some jalapeno cayenne pepper jelly with peppers from my garden and it turned out beautifully as you can see. So I'm very happy. I'm really glad I attended and just a shout out to all y'all who are hosting us today for such a wonderful webinar a few weeks back. 
So as you can see, canning is and preserving is one of the ways that we talk about and that falls under prevention. Now, of course, you can't donate your home canned or preserved goods, um, but um, that is a great way for you to preserve the fruits of your labor from your garden and make them last a little longer. So again, these are definitely uh, the full set of shelves at my house right now. Um, you'll see peach butter down at the bottom and pepper vinegar up at the top left, all kinds of stuff, blueberry syrups and jams. Um, yeah, just trying different things every time. I also didn't notice until after I took this picture, there's a, an incredibly smug looking little frog statue in the back there. So I, obviously I decided to use this photo because of that. <laughs> and since, um, um, since, I had such a serious quote before, I wanted to follow with an even more serious quote. Um, one thing to keep in mind with these canning projects is you might not be able to donate them, but they are tremendous gifts. Um, I, I have a few folks at the office who are like, yeah, I finished my pickles, can I get some more please? So you'll end up with a waiting list if you start doing this. But um, so you can see on your screen now some wise words from Michael Scott, from the office, uh, a very another very serious, uh, <laughs> serious man. All right, so let's keep talking about some prevention. Uh, we're going to play a fun game, and this you're going to have to use your chat box. So if everyone could make sure you have your chat box open, what you're going to do is send us some chats on what you think is wrong with this picture. Chat is disabled. Hmm. Okay, so I'm getting a message from about what is wrong with this. While this is a very beautiful basket of produce, there are some things that are going to not help you reduce waste in your kitchen from your garden. Now, obviously these items didn't come from our local garden. They came from a farmer's market basket, but let's talk about what we could do differently. So first problem is location. Everything in this basket should not be in the basket together. Uh, these things don't all belong together. Second problem, location. Heavier produce should never be on top of more delicate fruits and veggies. Um, those bananas are heavy, y'all, and so don't put them on top of your plums. And again, location. Some of these items belong in the fridge and not left in a basket out on the counter. So shout out to all of the folks in the chat. You guys are brilliant and saying literally everything that Amanda just said, um, along with some other things like may, those hot peppers might affect the flavor of the other things they're touching and also a valid point. Well, sometimes good, you don't always want spicy fruit. So the science behind all this is ethylene gas. There are ethylene producers and ethylene sensitive fruits and veggies. Um, also some fruits like a low humidity, some vegetables like a high humidity. The point being, it's the same as what we were talking about in your garden, knowing what you're growing. Know how to take care of each fruit and vegetable. Everybody needs something a little bit different, so they shouldn't all go in one basket. Um, one of the questions I get when we start talking about this to an audience is, wait, 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 wait. So you're telling me that an apple is an ethylene producer, but it's also ethylene sensitive. So what, am I supposed to just put my apples in different corners of my whole house? Uh, no, we don't have to go that far. The point is you don't want to just put all those apples in a bag and close it up or stack your bananas on top of your apples because that's going to cause everything to ripen way too fast 
And what we want to do is preserve our fruit for as long as possible so we have time to eat it. And also, the fresher your fruits and veggies are, the more nutrients you're going to get out of them. And so one of our comments in the chat box was also about locally, and that all of this was not locally grown. Of course, today we're talking about our own school gardens and community gardens. So on here, you'll see collard greens, cucumbers, sweet potatoes, onions. These are things that we grow here locally. Peaches, tomatoes, of course. So um, you will notice that there are some local type uh, produce on here that you want to pay close, close attention to in keeping them separate. So how do we fix the basket that we were looking at? This one is so much better. You can see Ada and I invested in a fancy basket. It was <laughs> um, a whopping $11 from Target. Now, we're not saying that everyone has to go buy a basket that has an option to hang bananas. But what you can do is keep your bananas separate from the things that we just talked about, like the avocados. Let's go through a little bit of these. So... Bananas, you want to keep them at room to away from other fruit. Um, if you can do a basket with a hanger, that's great. Also, one more thing on those bananas. Um, we work in, like, like Amanda said, we work in the recycling and waste reduction office, but it's a fun tip. If you do have saran wrap or cling wrap in your uh, kitchen, which most folks do, you can just take a little piece of that wrap around the tops of those bananas That'll keep them from producing as much ethylene, so they'll keep longer, and they'll um, sort of stop generating as much to make your other fruits and veggies ripen. Anyway, so the citrus, we want to keep those in the low humidity drawer in the refrigerator. They'll keep longer that way. For the plums, if they're unripe, you want to keep them out on the counter, um, but out of the sun. If they're already ripe and ready to eat, you can put those in the low humidity drawer, um, preferably in a paper bag in your refrigerator. Apples as well need to be in that low humidity drawer, but what you want to do with those instead of the paper bag, um, you can use a paper bag, but just make sure to leave it open or maybe a mesh bag. Uh, those reusable grocery bags are really great for this or even the little, if you do get the plastic bag that they have in the produce section at the grocery store or markets, um, you can use that as well. Just make sure that it's not sealed up tight. You don't want that ethylene being trapped in those apples. Peppers are the same low humidity drawer in the refrigerator, but as someone pointed out to us, you want to have some type of barrier, and that's why we're recommending the paper bag or mesh bag for your other fruit, because you don't want the peppers and your other fruit going in the same drawer and, and meshing together. Avocados are tricky little devils. I know that often I buy them and they're hard as rocks, and then a day later I go to eat them and they're squishy. So what you want to do is when they're unripe, keep them at room temperature. Don't stack them on top of anybody else or with anybody else. They're one of those top five generators of ethylene. Um, once they ripen, if you want, if you if you aren't going to eat them right then, go ahead and stick them in the refrigerator because that's going to cease that ripening process for them. And another quick tip that we Ada and I have <laughs> learned through this process because um, we're. We're all in this together and we're learning together. Um, but with Don't Waste Food and all the research that we've done, take a piece of cut onion. If you already have a cut avocado, put it face down in a glass bowl. Put your little piece of cut onion in there and put the lid on in the refrigerator. That onion is going to absorb all of the things that are making that avocado turn brown. And so once you take it back out, you'll actually still have a green avocado. So nice little quick tip for you there. Also for those of you who aren't super onion lovers, um, I, I only like a little bit of onion. I don't want everything to taste like it, don't worry. Um, it's not gonna make your avocado get super oniony. Um, when you put in a, a cut onion in the fridge, it's sort of like a sponge. Um, okay, so tomatoes. We've talked about tomatoes a lot. I think that was the favorite on the poll we did. So that's perfect for us because we have focused on tomatoes a lot. Um, a lot of people, I know it's a great, a great debate. It always has been in my family. My grandmother said, you aren't supposed to eat a tomato unless it's cold, but you aren't supposed to put it in the fridge until an hour before you're going to eat it. Otherwise it's going to get pithy. That's a lot to remember, right? <laughs> so 
so we have this handy little card for you and this um, you're going in your email you probably already got some links and I think Amy and her team is going to follow up with some other links but on our don't waste food SC website there is access to this card so it's a helpful little tip um, everything that we have is downloadable and printable so if you need to stick it on your fridge to remember these things that's usually what helps us so let's jump ahead to other ways to prevent food waste. So raise your hand, Can everyone can raise their hand on their attendee um, form. Uh, raise your hand if you, you know, okay, <laughs> all right, cool. Um, so ugly does not equal bad. Raise your hand if you agree. Let's go with that. Ooh, oh yeah, ooh, there we go. Okay, thank you. So I am so glad to see that we have so many in agreement on that because ugly does not equal bad. And there are all types of campaigns out there talking about ugly fruit, love ugly fruit, love, love ugly vegetables. Yes, please do love them and use them. Um, so you can see here, this pepper came uh, out of the garden. Is it perfect? No. Was it delicious? Absolutely. <laughs> so uh, let's not get into the hype that some manufacturers or retailers or kind of push us into in throwing away bad food. Let's continue to use it to nourish our bodies. The other thing that um, we want you to really keep in mind, I, I, I know we all, like Amanda was just saying, we do have this mindset when we go to the store, we want to find the perfect pepper, the perfect pear, the perfect tomato, but just because a piece of fruit or a vegetable has a little brown spot on it, especially if you grow it, you're way less likely to just throw that whole thing away because it has one bad spot. So we want you to learn to pair, get it? That's just for you, Ben. Um, <laughs> we want you to learn to pair and cut out those bad spots and then to continue to use the rest of what you've grown or what you've bought because there's no, there's no need to waste the whole thing just because there's one little blemish. All right, so for those of you that maybe in your fall garden, you're growing lettuce or cabbage or other things that are uh, really more fall related, you've harvested that and maybe weren't able to consume it quite quickly enough. So everything's looking a little wilty. How can you fix that? Do you have to throw it away? Do you have to um, compost it? If you're composting, no. Throw it in a bowl of cold water um, for celery, you can stick it in a glass of cold water, cut the bottoms off, stick it in a glass of cold water. Um, all of that water is simply just rehydrating. And once you do that, it's ready to consume and you have nice crisp lettuce and other vegetables. So the technique's a little different depending on which animal you're dealing with here. Um, I'm just kidding, vegetables, mineral. Um, but all of the, the answer, the punchline is the same. They just dried out a little bit, usually because of refrigeration. The refrigerator sucks the life out of just about everything. Um, so if you just give them a little bit of water, then they should perk right back up. All right, so we've done everything we can with fruits and vegetable and prevention. And so now do you think it's time to compost data? Yeah, girl. Whoa, 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 whoa. It's not time to compost yet. Okay, so let's back up a little bit and we can still use vegetables that are maybe wilted or maybe even what we consider waste of vegetables. How about, let's make some chimichurri. So this is Ada in my kitchen. Um, you can see this little video. She's chopping up some vegetables. I do want you to take note that she has not cut off any of the stems or the roots or any of the bad spots. Y'all, we're making chimichurri. It's going in a food processor. Nobody's gonna know that, nobody's gonna see that. And honestly, the skins and pieces that a lot of times that we cut off are the most nutritious. So we're putting a little olive oil and lemon juice in the food processor. You can see all those vegetables going in. Please take note of those carrot top greens. That's not parsley. We didn't have parsley that day, so we used those instead, instead of buying something that, you know, we really didn't need. So this was the finished product, and I highly recommend you using it as a vegetable dip or a marinade. My husband is one that likes to smoke beef on his smoker, so we did a beef brisket and topped it afterwards with this beautiful chimichurri. I will tell you it was a huge family hit. 
So we used all of those scraps, we made something else. Maybe you're not thinking you're quite as adventurous to do chimichurri. That's okay, let's learn a little bit from Tasty on what else we can make. So here you can see they've got a veggie scrap bag and they're chopping up some onions, the tops and bottoms and the skins. These are all things that probably we've all been guilty of tossing in the trash or going ahead and composting. If you're, if you're doing good, you're composting. But what do you say we do even better and use those things to make something that we can consume? So basically they've just kept this bag and in the freezer and they just keep adding to it. So every time they're prepping their vegetables or prepping their fruits or herbs, well, not really fruits in this bag, but herbs or vegetables, all of what is most of the time considered waste is going in this veggie scrap bag. Now you can keep that bag in the freezer. Um, on this video, it says up to six months, but the USDA actually says that if you put things in the freezer at zero degrees, then they will stay safe indefinitely. Now, if you're keeping them in there for long term, you may run into some freezer burn problems, which will affect the taste, but they will still be safe to consume. All right, so our favorite part is coming up. They're storing <laughs> things in glass jars, which can be frozen. Um, or, I love this, they're putting an ice cube tray full of that vegetable broth to make bouillon cubes. And if you'll please notice, of course, from the recycling side, she used the same Ziploc bag from the vegetable scraps to store the bouillon cubes in. So if you weren't hungry before this, you probably are now. Oh yeah, we forgot to warn you at the beginning. You'll probably be hungry by the end of this. But you can see that everything there, instead of throwing away or even composting, which is great, we weren't quite there yet. So we could still make good food out of what some people consider scraps. Another thing that we're gonna focus on really quickly is regrowth. So you're able to regrow vegetables. Um, we've done some of our own, um, but uh, we're gonna show you another video. And just to give you a heads up, we do have quite a few videos in here today. We're heavy on that today because we wanna provide you with resources that you can share with your students, either in the classroom or in a virtual setting. So you'll have access to all of these as well.
All right, so on that video, you saw quite a few uh, different items getting regrown. A couple of things. First, you can tell we love a tasty or a nifty video. They're great resources. Um, we have to give full credit to them. Um, if you're not sure about sharing those videos or using them, uh, you'll find that we have recreated a lot of the videos ourselves. And out of that video, um, we have tried every one of those with the exception to strawberries, kiwi, and raspberries. But everything else, um, we've given a shot at regrowing probably like what, 90%? We've had like a 90% success rate with that. The biggest key here is reducing, reusing, recycling, and regrowing in your own garden. And that is a huge waste preventer, not just of food, but of other resources. We love this picture because it does show you that you can use plastic water bottles, um, especially if you're not able to recycle those right now. Um, use them as a planter for your classroom or for at home and you could do a video yourself. Um, this is also a great way for your students to be able to see uh, the regrowth process, the root system, um, and also the life cycle of this plant. So they can, they can see the bottom and everything. So just to show you kind of some of the things that we did on our own, you can see here we did celery. Um, and of course, the one that we just put up is after about five days. And so you can put that in the soil. This one is a leek. And again, after about seven days, that's the growth on that one. And then we just simply transferred that one to the garden, put some soil on it and gave it a little water. We did the same with spring onions, and you'll notice the tops of those spring onions were used in the previous video for the chimichurri. On these, you can put them in water, or as we did, we just put them straight in the soil. Now, once they're in the soil, you're gonna water them, give them a couple weeks. You can see that was a fast couple weeks of growth, <laughs> but we just clip them as you need them. At that point, you don't need to pull the whole root out to use the spring onion. Clip it as you need it and it'll continue to regrow. Um, so this was after a couple of weeks of planting those in the garden, just so you can see a little close up, that leek, I mean, it's doing great. And then the one on the right is celery. Not sure how that one's gonna do, but we're still giving it a shot. Another way that you can work on regrowth is harvesting the seeds as you're prepping vegetables. So here you'll see that Ada is getting the seeds out, um, putting them in a container, of course, she's going to compost that top of the pepper. Um, but then any type of airtight, secure storage, so a bag, a container with a lid, any of that, you'll store for the next year. So you can see here, these were peppers from last year's seeds. So we have a couple of different types. But again, this is in my garden in my backyard. So a lot of produce happening. Um, I do share some with my neighbors. They seem to like it. So how, how do we keep all of this going? Um, how is the produce growing so healthy? Of course, it all comes down to the soil. So another way to reduce wasting food, believe it or not, is making sure you have healthy soil in your garden. So from one of the lessons out of our curriculum that we also produce out of our office through the Take Action SC program is learning about healthy soil. Here we have, we're gonna show a demonstration. You need some plates, some flour, a scoop, some water, leftover bread, but basically we're gonna show the flour as unhealthy soil. So this is gonna be like the sand, the thing you wouldn't want to necessarily plant a garden in. But getting your students to understand why this isn't great. You can see here we've poured water on it. It's just running off. We're gonna pour a little more water. Now in your demonstration, when you're ready to do it, make sure you dig your fingers into that flower because you're gonna see no water got to the center. If this was for a plant, that would be terrible. So now the bread is gonna represent healthy soil or compost because it's more like a sponge. You see, we put the water on. Where did the water go? This time it didn't run off as much and there's none underneath because the bread absorbed everything. Now, if there were plants in that, of course the water would be getting to the roots. So how do we make unhealthy soil better? Of course, we add compost. So here you can see we're mixing in our compost. We're mixing in our flour together. Um, 
and now the water is getting absorbed a little more. So what are the basics of building good compost? We've talked a lot about things that you can prevent or ways that you can actually use the produce from your garden, um, but let's talk about how to build compost. There are quite a few things that you can put in your backyard compost. So I know that was a fast little video. Of course, we have the resources available for you, but you can see again, um, just from the background, these are things that we already had here at my house to put in compost. You'll notice that egg carton. Of course, it's recyclable, but if you can cut that up and shred it, you can also use that as browns. Um, it's also really good if you want to do um, growing your own seeds. They have great little seed starters. You can just cut them apart and um, or keep them together, really. And you can just plant the whole thing once it's started to sprout and has a few leaves. Um, and it'll actually just decompose in the soil. Just make sure to plant it wet. Yeah, so as you're um, composting, let's give a few quick tips. Of course, we have a whole guide that you're getting, um, we're going through this fast, but you're gonna get a whole guide. So in compost, we typically recommend one parts green to one parts brown. So in that video, you saw some things that were green. Now questions that we one parts green to three parts brown brown sorry wow let me repeat that one part green <laughs> to three parts brown so the greens are your nitrogen the browns are your carbon a quick tip also if you have an open compost pile or you've made one out of pallets or anything like that you want to make sure that you are putting the last layer as browns so a couple of quick questions that we get on what consists of greens. I love um, a couple of the ones on the video we didn't include. Coffee grounds are green. No, they are not green, but they are heavy <laughs> nitrogen producers for your compost, and they're also great for your compost. So if you're a coffee drinker, save those to put in your compost as well. So that was a great presentation of which you should put in your compost, but there are also quite a few things that you should not put in your compost. So this is what we want to tell you to just say no to. Um, like this lovely tier of cheese, which actually um, you guys can't see it, but if you expand the photo, it's a, a wedding cake, but it's cheese instead, which I'm a massive fan of. Um, that being said, don't put the cheese in your compost. You don't want dairy products. Um, as mentioned earlier, but um, in a previous presentation, eggs don't count as dairy. Eggshells, we love in compost, um, but the dairy is your compost pile. If it's in a backyard or in a community garden, it's just not going to get hot enough to break down anything that's fatty. So meats, fats, oils, and grease, cheese, uh, even your yogurt. Like I've seen some people make that work, but don't do it. Just it it, it often ends badly and in lots of weird colors and shapes and beasts. Uh, <laughs> and of course, just to remind you, we are talking about backyard composting, or in this case, if you're doing a on-site school composting that you are managing yourself, that still falls under backyard composting. Um, if you are doing a commercial composting pickup, um, whole different ball game, whole different list of ingredients. So this is what we're talking about, just backyard or do-it-yourself composting. All right, I'm going to throw back to my childhood here. Um, every time I see a compost pile with out a nice layer of browns on top or where someone's put in a bunch of meat or cheese or any of that stuff that we know better than to put in, I think it, I remember Charlotte's Web, the animated version, and T Templeton when he goes to the fair and he sings the song about it being a veritable smorgasbord. So this is not what we want because my friends, you will get rats or raccoons or possums or any number of vectors is what we like to call them. But um, 
I'm a, I'm a fan of our furry friends, but I don't really want them creeping around in my backyard eating out of my compost bin. So that that's why we're telling you, make sure to keep a nice solid layer of browns on the top of everything you do. So um, we focused on backyard, which as Amanda said, technically if you're doing it in a community garden or in your school garden, what you have is backyard composting, but the people who are putting in, there are a lot more hands involved. Whoever is in charge of this needs to be sure that the products going into your compost bin are products that are generated in the garden. Um, as far as your greens go, you want, you know, trimmings and plants that maybe just didn't make it for some reason. Um, you don't want people, you don't want kids or neighbors, if you're doing the community thing, to bring food scraps from home. That's going to be a big problem as far as some other folks at DHEC are concerned. Um, so just generate the stuff on site. Don't bring a bunch of other stuff in. If you do want to do that, particularly in the community setting, feel free to contact the permitting folks at DHEC. I, I believe it's possible. It's just a, a lot more red tape than let's make a compost bin from our scraps that we're generating. Yeah, so you'll need to go through a permitting process or um, qualify with the permitting department um, that you fall under certain exemptions if you're wanting to start a community compost um, and have outside generated food scraps. Um, we can help walk you through that process, but for what we're talking about, everything should have been generated in that garden, with the exception of browns. So if you want to bring outside browns, whether that is shredded newspaper, um, shredded, of course, brown egg cartons, or dried leaves, those type things you can add to your community garden. Um, just, we don't want you to bring the food, uh, which is what is going to generate the bacteria that we don't want. So we always love to hear other composting stories and who's composting. Um, we have also learned when talking with kids in classrooms, sometimes we can tell them things and, you know, they're like, <laughs> okay, great. Who are these people and why are they talking to us? But if they know someone famous who likes to compost, sometimes it resonates with them a little better. So we're going to hear from Jason Mraz. Hey, what's up? I'm Jason Mraz. I'm here with Allison from Allison's Adventures, who is, with all her might, holding this massive heap of compost, which we are about to spread on my garden. Today, I joined multi-Grammy winner Jason Mraz on his organic avocado farm. Treats and mouth. You skip the farmer and the table. Uh, who needs a table? To learn about the importance of composting. So, you know, Jason, I was wondering, what do you think about um, composting? I don't think about it. I, I do about it. I'm actually here on it right now, and I just wanted to call in and say, uh, can you hear me? Do Hello? you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I just wanted to call in and say that I'm really impressed with your composting here, and I really hope that it keeps inspiring everyone around the world to uh, do their part. Thank you. Thanks for the acknowledgement, because calling me on this corn phone, I thought you were stalking me. <laughs> get it? Stalk. I totally get it. That was pretty corny, but I get it. Aloha. Hello. Oh, lucky I got to talk to you. We went to a pile where the food scraps had already broken down, and Jason put me to work. How does this help create life? In here is trillions of microbes, and when you put it on the soil, you're putting a big old cow plop on the earth that is unleashing trillions of microscopic little farmers that are bartering and trading energies and nutrients with root systems. I'm about to apply compost to my veggies. Hashtag compost life. Add more nutrients to my soil. I want to sequester water and more carbon out of the atmosphere because we know there's way too much of that up there. So how does composting help protect our waters? Well, by composting, we improve the soil so it pretty much becomes a sponge. When rain falls onto that soil, the more water we can store in the soil and refill our underground water reserves, the better all of those ecosystems improve and our runoff then for our streams that feed our rivers, that feed our oceans. From the top down, they start getting cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. So we do that 
with our with our footsteps and our practices at home. Simply by composting this avocado. That's correct. You can protect water. That's right. It blows my mind. What's growing on? What's growing on? What's growing on? You know, this reminds me of a song. We won't hesitate no more, no more. It cannot wait. Compost. Woo! Straight out of compost. Jason taught me an important lesson today. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> Join in. Go to your community garden. Get dirty. Thank you, Allison. Adventures. I, I love the adventure that I went on with you today. We can never give up on bettering the planet. Well, I won't give up on us, even if I'm the honored stars and just so happy that you are a voice, literally, of change in this world and of regeneration, saving our planet and uh, making it fun. She can't wait to spread this compost, much like she spreads aloha. Aww. I won't give up on us. Is this corny? Is this corny? Is this corny doing this? All right, so as you can see, composting is important worldwide. Um, right now, I am going to stop sharing so we can swap over to Ada's laptop because we're gonna do a live demonstration for you on how to make compost in a bottle. So this is a great demonstration for your classroom, either in person or virtually, um, basically just to show students how they can manage compost it gives them an opportunity to watch it in a clear bottle. They can see the process happening. Um, should take about 30 days um, to see any results. Um, but here we go. Let's see if we can get this going. All right. Can you hear me? Awesome. And I'm thinking you should be able to see me now. I just can't see it over there. I can't see either. Awesome. So, um, I'm going to look this up. So I'm a little muffled because I'm wearing a mask because I'm sitting right next to Amanda. <laughs> um, but here you should be able to see we have all of our material for this. This actually um, just like the previous items that Amanda talked about and that soil demonstration that we did. This comes from the Take Action SDA environmental curriculum supplement that Amanda also manages. So what we have here is we have everything to make compost in a bottle. What we've done, I'm trying to make sure I get this right. Um, we have cut open an empty two liter soda bottle and we've also put some holes in it for breathing. And what we do is essentially what we, we want to start with some soil. Um, we're out of soil right now. We used it all in the garden. So we're going to start with a layer of browns. Um, what we have is some Newspaper shreddings. I'm a big fan of all of those free newspapers that you can get. Um, so just lay some of those in there. We also have some packing material. It's just nice brown, no coating whatsoever, just good raw paper. And then got a pretty good layer of browns in there. What do you think, Amanda? Yeah, I think that's good. Okay, so now we've got some scraps that Amanda was awesome enough to save from cooking her dinner last night. We've got some little ends off of some green beans. We put those in there and a couple of the ends off of the squash and zucchini. Let's see, that's about, what do you think, one to three? Yeah, so you want to just keep in mind that you're keeping that one to three ratio, one part greens, three parts brown. Of course, in this compost bottle, it's gonna be a little dry because we didn't start with soil, but that's okay. Um, what we're gonna do afterwards, we're gonna add some things that have extra moisture. So you can see now Ada's putting in some onion clippings. Be careful with very pungent vegetable items, especially in this bottle demonstration, because uh, you wanna make sure you don't pick up those smells in your classroom or your house. <laughs> and um, we do we do like to do this one because um, a lot of folks get super intimidated when it comes to composting and they say like oh 
this is like real science and I don't know if I can handle that. I'm going to mess it up. I'm going to end up with a big smelling mess. And so this is a good thing for adults as well as kids to sort of show them you can manage that. Like if you can manage this little bottle, just make it a little bit bigger and put it in your backyard and it'll actually be a lot easier um, as long as you're following the right steps because mother nature is going to help you out. So now you see Ada digging in our coffee grounds. There, there yeah. you go. And so all of these things we just kept in the refrigerator until we were ready to start this process. I do recommend that you don't just leave them on the counter or it's going to be a little bit messy before you start with your class. <clears throat> now with the coffee grounds, keep in mind those are greens, they're nitrogen. So we're going to finish up with a really nice layer of browns on top of that. So a couple of different ways that you can vary this project. You can either do browns and then soil or extra browns. Just make sure if you're doing extra browns that you may have to spray it with a little water. All right, so just for a purpose of demonstration today, um, we're not going to fill up this whole bottle, but you can see here Ada has a peach that we had. Now there's one bad spot on that peach. So we're going to cut that part off and put it in our compost bottle, but the rest of the peach is still great. So we're going to save that part, have a little snack later. Later. Or now. <laughs> cool. All right, in the bottle it goes. And then obviously in your demonstration with your class, you want to make sure that everyone knows to chop things up. That's going to make them decompose a little faster so you can see it within that 30 day period. All right. So for this one, we would have to spray it with a little water and then we would just tape where we cut it. And as you're watching it with your class, or if you're videoing this to monitor over a time lapse to show virtually, um, you may have to give it a little shake every once in a while to get everything kind of mixed in together. That is what we would consider compost turning. But <laughs> basically you would be able to watch the decomposition process right in this bottle. All right, so we're gonna go back. And we're back. All right, so just to wrap up really quickly, and um, we talk pretty fast, so uh, we've hopefully not taken up too much of your time, but how can you get involved in this process with us? So it's pretty easy and extra credit for today is become an ambassador. So with the Don't Waste Food SC program, we have an ambassador program on top of that. So an ambassador just means that you wanna get involved. It's a pretty simple way to be a part of Don't Waste Food SC. It encompasses individuals, communities, businesses, institutions, schools, colleges, and universities. Um, and we already have quite a few ambassadors getting on board with us. Um, it's really easy. All you have to do is tell us, um, there, this form can be downloaded and you'll get a link to that, and tell us what you're doing to either prevent, donate, or compost your food waste, either at home, at your school, at your business, at your institution, and then also how you are promoting that you are doing that. So how are you sharing the Don't Waste Food SC campaign by what you're doing? So very simple. Um, we also have a website, scdhec.gov slash DWFSC, and we will be sharing all of our ambassadors on that website very soon. We also provide resources and guides on that website. You can see here on the right-hand side, Ada and I have both mentioned this Action for a Cleaner Tomorrow curriculum supplement, which is part of our Take Action SC partnership. We just had a webinar last week. I know a few of you were on there and we appreciate you being on there. Uh, you do have to go through a training in order to get a copy of this curriculum with 22 lessons in it. Um, we do have a website for that, takeactionsc.org. Uh, we also offer classroom presentations um, through that and teacher workshops. So on the left-hand side, you'll see a couple of guides 
Uh, these are specifically for schools. So if you wanna start composting at school or reducing food waste at school, there are different techniques in there. In that reducing food waste guide, another huge shout out to the Office of Health and Nutrition at the Department of Education. Um, a great partner for us on that and helping us get share tables started and different things like that. We've gotten a lot of questions recently on will share tables still be a thing going forward? Um, and what we're hearing is yes, it will still be a thing. There will probably be some new guidelines in making sure that we are reducing the spread of COVID-19. So um, we also have guides for home, for reducing waste and composting. All of those are available for download or print from our website. Or if you wanna just shoot us an email, uh, Romy Tomato is our mascot for Don't Waste Food <laughs> SC and there um, is myself and Ada again. We'd love for you to fill our inbox as much as you're filling your compost. Um, our email address is there. We are also on social media through Facebook and Instagram. Please like our post. Please share any cool things that you're doing with your class or with your groups. Uh, we'd love to hear about those as well. Thank you guys.